We're back. Yes, we are back. Fascinating. So, Christina Kenny got a nutri bullet and a copy machine. It's Christina Kenny, lucky, and Patrice Bradfields. I didn't hear what the two prizes were, but um, superb stuff. Um, double winners all round. I didn't see my name getting pulled out there, though, Fergus. So, there must be a problem. I think the problem was he probably spent much more money on that backdrop. That was the thing that stood out for me the most, to be honest. That backdrop in the in the office there is pretty um is pretty remarkable. So um, kudos on the team who spent hours painting those roses. It's pretty impressive. Um, pretty impressive indeed. But um, it's not now for me to talk again any further um, because we're very very lucky that uh, we are joined for the second of this evening's sessions. And the second of the season of this evening sessions is going to go through really what is pretty evident. It's it, it's it's the topic, and a number of questions came in for Professor Plant in our earlier discussion. But it's really looking at the impact and how of trio and how the impact is is uh, is is putting onto the different people that have been taking Cap Trio. And we're very honoured, as you can see, artist Professor Paul McNally uh, joins us from his studio this evening and he's going to take us through, um, thankfully, an update on the Recover Project, of which, as a father of a young boy with cystic fibrosis, I'm very privileged that my son is starting out on this Recover Project. So it's, it's something that as a parent of someone living with CF, I'm, I'm passionately interested to hear how things have been going, but I'm also really keen to know how, how things have been on uh, everything in relation to CF and obviously Paul's new role and continued progression in the department. My brief intro for Professor McNally, I think I did this previously, Paul, so I'm not going to read out all of your accolades and all of your awards because no, we, won't have, we won't have enough time. But I, I think the new role that Paul has taken up in terms of the CF lead at CHI in Cromlin and, of course, the National Children's Research Centre, it's great to hear the continued investments, Paul, that you, your team, your colleagues are making. And we're very privileged and honoured to have you on this evening. Um, a lot of uh, patients of yours, a lot of parents of patients of yours that have uh, been under your care are also greatly appreciative of the work that you and the team continue to do. So. Without further ado, I'll, um, I'll let you go through your presentation, give us the update on the Recover project, and then we'll transition there into a discussion with the Capitrio panel afterwards. So thank you, Paul, and over to you. Okay, so thanks a million, Keith, and uh, I'm delighted to be able to talk to you about Recover. We've been planning this for a long time, and it's, uh, it's great to see it actually happening. So... Um, uh, you will have seen on the agenda that I'm down for 55 minutes and you'd be glad to hear I won't be talking for 55 minutes because uh, like a general anaesthetic, there's nothing more sure to put you asleep after a long day than a 55 minute talk uh, full of slides. So I won't be doing that. Um, so I'm going to go through. Um, sorry, these are just uh, my disclosures. I've received funding, including from CF Ireland uh, who support this project. Um, I'm going to go through a brief study overview. I'm going to talk a little bit about where the study came from and what the rationale behind it was. We're going to get into a little bit more detail about what's involved in the study, um, especially the more kind of novel aspects. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about our results that we presented at the North American conference and uh, what's happening with our progress. And then we'll talk about uh, you know, the, the data that we've collected, what it actually means and where we want to go to next with it. Okay, so in terms of the overview, then, um, some of you will know about Recover and um, some of your um, kids or some of you may even be involved in Recover. So it's an, it's an ongoing uh, multi-centre real world study and it's based in CF centres in Ireland and in the UK. And we're looking at the Im uh, impact of uh, CAFTRIO uh, as it's prescribed clinically. So we're not, this is not outside of clinical prescription of CAFTRIO. So obviously the first phase is the 12 and, and, and older uh, cohort uh, who have started it. And the next phase that we're gonna be starting soon is the six to 11 cohort uh, and, and it's imminent. Uh, so we understand uh, it's been approved obviously for children age six to 11. It's just a funding agreement that's taken some time over it. So um, Recover looks at a broad array of outcome measures and I'll talk about these. Uh, and the study lasts for two years. So in each cohort that starts the study, they'll stay on it for two years. And the primary outcome measures that we want to look at are lung clearance index. Um, I'll explain what that is for those who don't know. And also spirometry controlled CT scores. And we'll go through that as well. 
So we're targeting uh, 237 participants in total in the two different age groups. So the study, as I said, is taking place in eight centres in the UK and Ireland. So the three CHI centres in um, uh, Dublin and also St Vincent's, and then in Belfast, the adult and paediatric site, uh, the Brompton uh, in London, and uh, University Hospital Limerick, the, the paediatric uh, part of UHL. So these are the outcome measures. I'll, I'll talk um, briefly about them now, and then we'll go into a little bit more detail. So just starting on the left then with the lung-related outcome measures. So lung function, everybody knows what FEV1 is. So that's, you know, you can't do any study in CF without measuring um, FEV1. Uh, we're looking at lung clearance index as well, and I'll explain that, and I'll, I'll explain CT in a minute. Um, there's a test called exhaled nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a gas that lives in our lungs, and uh, it's particularly low in CF, and uh, the nitric oxide pathway in CF is very interesting. And previously, Kaleidoco was shown to increase nitric oxide, um, which is uh, um, a significant finding in terms of airway inflammation. Uh, and so we're measuring that in this study too. We'll also be looking at some of the byproducts of nitric oxide in the lower airways. We want to know uh, what happens to exacerbations requiring IVs and also oral antibiotic use, and we'll be measuring these. Uh, we'll be collecting in the same way that the registry does airway sputum microbiology samples um, that are processed in the hospital labs. We won't be measuring that ourselves. And then we'll be looking at airway inflammation uh, both in the nose and in the, in the lungs. And our colleagues in Belfast are helping us with this. So outside of the lungs then, um, we'll be looking at uh, the abdomen in, in, a, in a number of different ways. We're looking at abdominal symptoms, which we think are very important and people with CF think are important. Um, at nutritional indices, you know, of growth. Um, fecal calprotectin and M2PK, they're inflammatory markers that can be found in the stool and they indicate whether there's inflammation happening in the bowels. Uh, and so calprotectin in particular is very useful in CF. Um, we're measuring fecal elastase, which is a, a marker of a pancreatic, um, what we call exocrine function, so how your enzymes are working. And obviously we know with very young children on Kaleidoco, uh, there can be some rescue of pancreatic function. So we'll be trying to keep an eye on that, particularly in the younger kids. Um, we're looking at how much pancreatic enzymes people use. Uh, we want to try and establish whether Captrio has any impact, positive or negative, on liver disease. So we're doing this by um, measuring bloods, uh, spleen size on ultrasound, and also physical examination. Again, no uh, CF uh, study looking at modulators we can, would be complete without measuring sweat chloride. So we're, we're measuring this on a a regular basis. Uh, we're doing nasal lavage as well, which is not a commonly um, done thing, I suppose, from a diagnostic perspective in CF. A lot of people will do nasal washes, um, but we are uh, washing in saline and washing it back out again to try and see, can we detect any inflammation uh, in the nasal cavity and the sinuses? Um, we're going to be looking at adherence uh, as well, and I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. And then a lot of people know about CFQR. It's a uh, quality of life uh, questionnaire. Okay, so where did this all come from? So, so real world studies that look at um, uh, medications in in the real world, as opposed to in a clinical trial, uh, they're not uncommon. Um, and uh, I think we have the luxury in CF of uh, two things. First of all, there was a great study called the Goal Study, which was put in place when Kaleidoco uh, was um, on the way. And this was a, a very well thought out uh, study that the CF Foundation funded uh, in the US. And uh, Goal taught us a huge amount of stuff about what you could learn outside of clinical trials uh, about new treatments and also about the disease itself. And so uh, armed with this knowledge of how important real world studies are, and when we knew that uh, or CAMBI was going to be approved in children aged 6 to 11, we had quite a, a long lead-in time to, you know, with the knowledge that it would be funded in, in children aged 6 to 11. We set up a study um, called C-Forms uh, to look at the impact of that, and that was one of the origins of uh, Recover. I'll tell you a little bit about that. 
So uh, CFORM stands for the Children's Follow-Up or Canby Real World Study. So it was just, just kids aged 6 to 11 who were started in Honor Canby. And it was based in the three CHI sites and in Limerick and Des Cox and Crumlin uh, was leading out on this study. And so the two key measures that we wanted to do for this study, um, given that we knew what our can be, it wasn't going to be a dramatic effect. There was going to be a kind of a more moderate effect. So we wanted to look at LCI and spirometer control CT because they're really, really sensitive. So we partnered with Jane Davies, uh, who a lot of you will know from uh, London and also Harm Tiddens from Rotterdam, who's a, uh, an international lead in, in, in imaging in, in children with CF. And uh, we recruited 71 children uh, with CF, age 6 to 11. And uh, we worked with, uh, with the guys in Rotterdam and London. And we presented the data at the North, North American CF in 2021. So, you know, first of all, we learned something from the results of the study, but we learned a huge amount about running a real-world study as well. And I think uh, a lot of the learnings from this is what helped us to put recover in place. So... I won't bore you with looking through all of the, the details, um, but effectively we learned two key facts from this study. The first is that, and I think this is really important, in, in a large study in children aged six to 11 of Orcambi, they demonstrated that there, there seemed to be a significant improvement in LCI. It was just about um, uh, the improvement that you would expect for uh, a, a proper improvement in, in lung function. Um, but it, they, they did reach significance. But we didn't find that in the real world. And of course, in clinical trials, everything is really tightly controlled. Uh, you know, everybody's, everybody's, you know, checked out within an inch of their life throughout the trial. So it, it's a very controlled situation. Um, and they, you know, select specific patients with specific, you know, lung function targets and whatever. So effectively, this study told us that, like, whatever it says in the trial, in the real world, it doesn't hold true. So that was the first thing. And the second thing is that despite being on our canby, uh, bronchiectasis progressed in these children. And this is the first time that we that anybody uh, has shown this, um, that, that, uh, that you have pr a continued progression of bronchiectasis despite being on a modulator. And I suppose, you know, we kind of knew in a way that our canby you know, it, it's not as potent as Ivacaftor was, and it's not as potent of, as Catrio is going to be, or is. Um, and so, not a huge surprise, but really, really important to have found out this information because it's, you know, it's really helpful in terms of deciding who to treat and how to treat them. So that was, you know, so we learned a good bit about the study, and thankfully, even with just 71 patients, we were able to deduce, you know, quite useful clinical information out of it. So what's the rationale for real world studies then, studies like this? So first of all, you want to replicate the data that you saw in clinical trials. And, and we've shown what lots of other people have shown is that the data is not always the same in a real world study as it, as it was in a clinical trial. So we want to then measure outcomes that weren't measured in trials. So and none of the trials of any modulator so far have used CT to measure bronchiectasis, you know, which is understandable. And, understandable in a way because it's it's complicated and difficult to do and it involves radiation. However, it's a bit surprising in a way because it's one of the most important things about lung disease and CF is that you develop bronchiectasis. Um, so, you know, we measure things that weren't measured in trials. Um, and then sometimes you have unexpected issues that happen in the real world. And if you're running a real world study, you can flex a little bit and try and pick up on them. Uh, but then I think one of the most important things is the, the real life implications. And so there's a few examples of really, really great real world studies happening at the moment, like CF Storm um, and like uh, Simplify. And there are two studies that are looking at withdrawal of nebulized therapies uh, and the safety and rationale behind withdrawing uh, nebulized therapies in people with CF. So they're really, really smart and courageous um, type of studies that um, uh, are difficult to do, but are going to teach us a lot, I think. So a lot of people will have seen this data but maybe not presented this way so the, the the james lind alliance priority setting partnership in the uk and also the cystic fibrosis foundation process where they try to figure out between um people looking after people with cf and people with cf what are really the priority areas for people with cf uh in terms of research 
And so and I won't go through all of these, obviously, but uh, I mean, as part of an exercise that I did a number of years ago, we looked at these and uh, we, what are the kind of the, the key themes that come out between both of these? So, I mean, you know, unambiguous things that are impo of importance to people with CF. And so top of the list is GI symptoms and nutrition. And obviously, a lot of the people who look after people with CF, we are um, respiratory doctors, so we tend to focus on the lungs. So GI symptoms is a big thing. And treatment burden uh, is the second, uh, you know, major issue, the, the amount of treatment that people have to do. Um, uh, the other antibiotic treatment of infections, in fact, was probably relevant maybe five years ago, is becoming less and less relevant, thankfully, as we move on. Um, so if just if you look at the, the top two of these, these are some of the key um, outcome measures that we want to include in recover, because obviously we understand like there's no point in measuring stuff if it's not relevant to people who actually have CF. Um, so that's what real world studies allow you to do. OK, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the more detailed stuff about uh, recover now. Um, so first thing I'm going to talk about is lung clearance index. So I know a lot of the parents of children will know what LCI is because their kids will have done it, uh, but not everybody will know what it is. So, so spirometry or FEV1, uh, you know, your typical lung function in CF is useful to a point, but it's not very sensitive. So it's not good for early lung disease. Um, and it's not good actually for comparing individuals uh, because the range of normal is between 80 and 120. If you, if you go into any secondary school anywhere and you test a thousand kids, you do their lung function, they're all going to, the majority are going to sit between 80 and 120. So there's perfectly healthy people with an FEV1 of 80 and perfectly healthy people with an FEV1 of 120. So we don't have a single normal value there's a bit of a spread, and so it's not the best test in the world. So LCI is a test that's much, much more sensitive. It's not very good when your FEV1 is 40 or 60, but is really good when your FEV1 is 80 or 90. And so uh, it just involves having a mask and just normal tidal breathing. You don't have to do any breathing maneuvers. And the, the, the machinery and the technology picks up on uh, mixing of gases in the lungs and, and tells us what you're small effectively what your small airways are like so this has become more and more of a thing in cf and we're going to see more and more of it in the future in the era of modulators when people have you know less severe lung disease so we're working with the guys in the brompton that's jane davies um, uh, um, and her two of her chief physiologists who are working on the study um, and they have a european cf society core facility for um, lci and they're, they've done all the you know, remote training. Every single LCI that's done is sent to them. It's overread, quality controlled, and sent back. So we have a really fantastic structure about how we can collect this data. And this is, this is a really key part of the study um, because it's such a sensitive test. Um, and it's going to be so well kind of, um, uh, the reasons are going to be so well controlled. So spirometry controlled CT then, I, I think we all, probably understand what CT is. It's a, you know, an X-ray is a two-dimensional representation of a, a three-dimensional structure. So if you look at your chest, you know, you've, it, it's wide and it's, it's, uh, it's got breadth from front to back, but an X-ray just gives a flat picture of it, whereas a CT looks at it all the way through in three dimensions. And so picks up a huge amount of extra information than you would get from a chest X-ray, but it involves radiation. So over the last, um, many years, um, one of our collaborators, Harm Tiddens, uh, who you see there uh, pointing out the heart in a, in a um, CT scan, um, uh, has been developing lower and lower and lower dose uh, protocols for CT. And um, one of the key things that um, his team and others have developed is this thing called spirometry control. And effectively, um, uh, everybody will know what spirometry is. It's, it's, it's just the machine you blow into when you're doing lung function. And so you can see on the bottom right, if, if you can make it out, this is a little boy who's having a CT scan and he's breathing into a spirometer. So he breathes in and out and the, the physiologists uh, can look at it as he breathes and make sure they get him at full lung capacity and when he's totally empty as well. So if we do it and, and we, we monitor their breathing exactly as they are, are getting scanned, we can make sure that we standardize exactly when we take the images. And that means it's much easier to compare one to the other or to compare, you know, this year with next year with the year after. 
So again, there's a whole team there who look after all the centralized training and overreading, and we send all of our scans to Rotterdam to be um, processed. And they've also are working with an outside company, an artificial intelligence company to, to do um, a, a very novel form of um, ratio testing, looking at the airways and, and, and arteries. So I think, you know, for us, when we started Recover, we weren't going to start doing stuff like this ourselves. We wanted to team up with the experts, the world experts, uh, to ensure that, you know, every outcome that we looked at uh, was done to the, to the nth degree. So we've been working really closely with these guys. In terms of the, the tummy problems uh, in CF, you know, obviously the liver is a big issue in CF and you'll know that, you know, in Ireland, we have, you know, one of the best long-term liver disease studies in the world. Uh, Marion Rowland, um, Aidan McCormick and Billy Burke have been running this for a long time. So we obviously have all of this long-term data and uh, we are using the previous data and looking at what happens when people go on to, um, to modulators. So we're doing this through ultrasound, through physical examination and also through blood tests. So uh, this will be very interesting. But I think it's the longer term, uh, you know, as this goes year after year, that we'd be really interested in. Jochen Mainz then works in Brandenburg in Germany, and he collaborates with us on uh, the bowel problems that we get in CF. He's developed a specific abdominal symptom score that's specifically for people with CF. Some of the other scores that are used are just developed more generally. Uh, and they don't really relate. Uh, they're not very useful in CF. Um, and so we're also looking at gut inflammation and fecal elastase, and this has been done in Germany with uh, Jochen and its team. And then I, I told you we were looking at adherence, so we're very lucky to have Alexandra Quitner working with the team, and many of you will have heard of her. She's the, the, the world expert, really, on adherence in people with cystic fibrosis. Um, so she's working with Sharon Sutton, who's a, a PhD uh, candidate of ours. And, you know, adherence is a hard thing to measure. So we're measuring it every way you could possibly measure it. We're looking at um, pharmacy pickup rates. So the, the amount of medication that people actually hold. We're looking at parent and patient reported uh, adherence. We're asking people about barriers to treatment uh, and, and medication beliefs. And we're also using this little digital pillbox over here called a MEMS cap. Uh, and this records every time uh, the medication is taken out. So this is actually a direct measurement of adherence. And we're using this for a subset of the patient on the recover study to measure how um, their adherence is like with Captrio itself. So we're not doing this for everything, um, just for a few things. So I think it, the adherence story is really, really interesting. And I think we're mature enough to, in CF to know that this is not kind of, you know, Big Brother or the secret police. What it is really is trying to understand, like, what are people doing and what are people taking? What we want to know is what happens. We're all very excited when we start something new and does the adherence fall off over time? Uh, and then what happens to non-modulator treatments like every other treatment uh, in the real world? Uh, do people take less or more? or How does it vary over time? Uh, and the, the key thing is that we want to look at, so we have an ability to be able to look at adherence across the board and say, OK, well, in the group with less adherence, here's what the lung function or the LCI or whatever ended up being and, and vice versa. So you, we can look at it kind of anonymously across the board and try and understand what different adherence levels actually mean. So that's just a flavor of some of the things that we have going on. We have other collaborators then, um, which I won't go into, looking at um, airway nitric oxide metabolism, looking at how genetic modifiers influence how people do with CF. Uh, Paul Cotter in Cork is looking at the microbiome of the, of the nose, the gut, and the lung, and we're looking at that all in one. Um, Cliff Taggart in Belfast is doing all our inflammation work, and obviously we're working really closely with Laura and Godfrey in the registry uh, around all the data management and statistics and merging this with registry data so that we get the best um, insight into what the data means. Okay, in terms of results then, so where are we now? So... This is just interesting. I, I told you a little bit about um, LCI at the start and just, just bear with me while I kind of explain to you what, what all these uh, scatter of dots mean. Um, if we start over on the right hand side here and look at this is, this is our baseline lung function for, for these are all 12 and above. And so you see um, all the, the, the first group is all, second group is FF and those are homozygous for F5 Voigtel. 
And the third group then is the minimum function mutation. So minimum function on FI with del. And you can see there that, um, you know, the numbers go less as we go right. And that's, you know, to be understood. Um, the two gray lines here indicate 80 and 120. So that's considered the normal range, 80 to 120. So you can see here, a huge amount of people are within that normal range. And then there's a group that are outside of the normal range. But then when we look at LCI, you can see this gray line here of 7.5, that's the normal uh, level. And actually LCI is a fantastic test because your, your results should be 7.5, whether you're four years of age or 94 years of age. Uh, so it's it's a it's a really great test that it doesn't have a huge range. There is just there's just a kind of a normal value, and so you can see here, while there are some people who are normal or in in the normal area, there's loads of people who are abnormal. And what this tells us is, LCI is a way more sensitive test. We've picked up abnormalities in people who we thought were in the normal range with lung function. So that's just a, a kind of an interesting story to start the uh, an interesting um, tale to start the story if you like. So uh, again there's a lot of numbers on this slide so I'll, I'll talk you through it. So this is data from all participants uh, in the first six months. So if you look on the left here you can see the variable. So we're looking at sweat chloride, LCI, FEV1, weight Z score, BMI Z score and uh, pheno or nitric oxide. Now for those who don't know Z score is a um, it's a it's called a weighted average so it is um, um or maybe that's not the right description of it so zero is the average so if you're plus one you're well above average if you're minus one you're well below average so they're kind of tight like even if you went from zero to 0 0.1 that's quite a significant improvement okay so if we look at we're looking at baseline data compared to six month data. So what this slide is telling us is if we take everybody all in, what difference have we noticed with Catrio? So you can see that the six month values are um, have the red box around them. So effectively we saw a 40 millimole drop in sweat chloride, uh, an improvement in LCI of two units. Now one unit is significant. Um, if you're over one unit, there's a significant difference. Like if you're well today and sick tomorrow, the difference in your LCI would be one or more. And so that's a pretty significant improvement. The, the change in lung function was 8.6% increase. Um, the weight Z score went up pretty much 0.3, same with the BMI Z score. And that's really striking. Like going up by 0.3 in six months is really substantial. Uh, and again, that's no surprise to anybody. Uh, who's either on CAFTRIO or knows somebody on CAFTRIO. And then the exhaled nitric oxide went significantly up as well. And again, it's not unexpected based on what we've seen before. So overall, I mean, it wouldn't be a genius to have, you know, uh, predicted this beforehand, improvement in all of these variables. So then <clears throat> uh, again, just try not to look at all of the numbers everywhere. I have the red boxes around the bits that I want you to concentrate on. So the group at the top here have two copies of the f 5 weight del mutation, and the group at the bottom have one copy of the 5 weight del and a minimum function mutation. So what we can see at the start here is that the, the group, the f 5 weight del group started with a much lower sweat chloride, 76 compared to 92 in the minimum function group. And that's because the f 5 weight del group were already on or can be or sim heavy um, before starting. Uh, and the minimum function people were naive to modulators. So what we saw is pretty much in both groups, even the F5 weight del ones who were already on um, or can be an extra 40 millimole reduction in sweat chloride. So after all of this, um, at six months, the mean um, sweat chloride was 36 in, in those with, C, with the F5 weight del uh, homozygous and 52 with minimum function mutations. So you can see um, there's quite an advantage in terms of the two F5 weight L mutations in terms of your ultimate sweat chloride. Um, and, and so this was a little bit of a surprise. We kind of expected them to end up somewhere not too dissimilar, I suppose, especially in this older cohort. So this was the notable finding uh, from in terms of uh, sweat chloride. 
What we wanted to do then is look across everybody in the study to see, you know, do some people have a big change in sweat chloride and do some people have a small change in sweat chloride? And we're currently looking at this data to try and figure out, you know, why. If some people have a small improvement and some people have a big improvement, can we predict who's going to have a big improvement and who's going to have a small improvement? And what, what does that mean? So we're currently working on that. So this, so each um, blue bar is an individual. And this is not all of the data. It's just a subset uh, of the data. So you can see there's a huge variation. Um, so over here on the right-hand side, you've got somebody who had an 80 millimole reduction in sweat chloride. And on the left-hand side, somebody who had a 12 millimole reduction in sweat chloride. So there's an absolutely huge difference between the highest and the lowest. And even in, in the middle, there's a massive spread. So this is really intriguing. We kind of knew this from clinical trials and a lot of work is gonna happen in the next, I think five or 10 years to try and par pick this apart and find out you know, how we can get people to respond better or who, who does well and who doesn't do well. So then what, what we wanted to look at is, um, we wanted to look at, uh, at the six month time point. And so um, I'll, I'll explain what we're seeing here to you. So on the left hand side, we've the six month sweat chloride in those people who are homozygous for the F5OHL. Okay, so two copies of F5OHL. So there's 40 people in this group. And so we want to know, at six months, what's your sweat chloride looking like? Is it over 60? And remember, 60 is diagnostic, over 60 is diagnostic of CF. 40 to 60 is borderline. Less than 40 is technically normal, but less than 30, 30 to 40, it's always a bit, you know, gray, but less than 30 is definitely normal. And what we found is even in these older cohort, that 44% of them had a normal sweat chloride level, uh, which is, is much higher than I expected actually before we started. And 53 then are in this, you know, 30 to 60 area. But then if we look at those with minimum function mutations in f 5 del it tells a very different story. Um, a third of them are still over 60. Um, 30 to 60 percent of them uh, are sorry 60 percent of them are in the 30 to 60 and only nine percent are less than 30. So there's definitely a genotype effect here uh, with Keftrio. The you know the more copies of 508L you have uh, the, the better your response to Keftrio. Okay so um, we then looked at LCI. Um, so again you've got the four boxes here the F5OHL homozygotes up the top and the minimum function mutations down the bottom. Um, and you can see the starting LCI in the F5OHL group, 11.6 down to 10.10, .10, so a reduction of 1.5, but a much more sizable reduction in those who weren't previously on a modulator of minus 2.6. So if you look, the, uh, the red is the minimum, mutate, minimum function and the blue is the F5OHL. If you look on the top right corner at the two curves, this tells a little bit of a different story in that um, the, uh, the LCI before starting was obviously higher in the minimum function group because they weren't on modulators, but after it, it was the same. So despite the fact that the people with Delta 5 weight homozygous have a lower sweat chloride, their LCI is the same. So you know, you, you could spend all day trying to figure this one out and there's lots of different reasons for it. Um, but this will, this type of, you know, interesting finding is what's gonna take us a long time to kind of pick through our data and, you know, look at our data with other people, with other groups data as well. Yeah, uh, but a finishing sweat chloride, it's, or a six months, uh, sorry, LCI of 10.10 .10, uh, is a significant improvement, uh, whatever way you look at it. So then if we look at lung function itself, FEV1, um, and, you know, we know our CAMBI didn't, you know, made a small um, dint in lung function, but not a significant one. So not a surprise then that you could see at the start, the f 5 tells and the minimum function group had similar enough lung functions. Um, and then um, uh, afterwards, there was an improvement in both groups, but a more substantial, substantial improvement in those with uh, minimum function mutations. Um, again, that's not that surprising because they would have had a lot of mucus plugging more so than people on or can be. So the finishing lung function was a bit higher in the minimum function um, group. And you can see that in the, the figure on the top right. Now I will say these are, you know, this isn't a huge number of data and it's only at, 
uh, our number of subjects and it's only at six months. So, um, uh, you know, time will tell how, you know, whether this maintains any level of significance. And in terms of abdominal symptoms then, so um, some of you who are at the North American uh, CF conference will have noted that the PROMISE study, which is a similar type of study that to what we're running, but it's running in, the North, in North America, they uh, had a large number of patients and they used a few different types of abdominal symptom scores and didn't find any difference with CAFTRIO. Uh, and a few different groups did it. Uh, so that was a bit of a surprise to us, particularly because we presented at the same conference and saw a significant improvement even after a month on CAFTRIO. And this is in a few of the different areas, but no change in, in appetite, uh, in disorders of appetite, I should say, uh, and no difference in bowel movements, um, which is kind of consistent with what I think we see in clinic. Um, uh, but anyway, so we're presenting our six month data on this at the European conference. So we are really delighted to have started working with the uh, group in Brandenburg, because obviously we, we banked on the right abdominal symptom score, uh, which uh, showed something compared to the, uh, the scores that they were using in the US. So, so overall, we saw improved lung function, uh, lung function uh, FEV1, as we saw in trials and LCI. This is a new finding. This hasn't been looked at in children aged 12 and above and adults before. So uh, we also found a significant improvement. Um, so a chloride is better. We expected this. Uh, definitely a genotype advantage for uh, F508 homozygotes. Um, but we don't really know what that means. Well, does that translate into different outcomes? We don't know yet. Um, and what was really encouraging is the amount of people in the 508 Dell group who had a normal sweat chloride at six months. Uh, and we've seen a improved abdominal symptom scores. Uh, and again, this is very uh, reassuring. Okay, so uh, but I'm doing okay with time. So in terms of progress then, um, so uh, I'm not gonna go into this in detail. Uh, this was a very tricky study to get up and running. Um, we, uh, you know, COVID-19 had a big impact on getting it through the research offices and the various centers, getting it through ethics, uh, you know, obviously, the drug approval was accelerated during COVID because of, uh, at this stage, unfounded fears about COVID and CF. Um, so everything happened a bit quicker. So uh, we did manage to get things off the ground. And as you can see, we've got good data, but it was a bit of a struggle. So where we are at the moment is we're just finishing off the one year data collection from the older group. We've already started recruiting for the six to 11 group, although the drug hasn't started yet. And in the long term, we're planning for a follow on study that I'm going to just very briefly mention to you now. So, here are some of the milestones. So, the 10th of September 2020 was our first recruit, and that was thanks to Barry Lennon down in Limerick. So, we have 116 adolescents recruited. Um, we have, I won't go through all of this, but we've done 131 parameter controlled CTs now. This is a, a testament to the study teams because these are complex things. We have to coach the patient beforehand. We have to go down to the scanner uh, with the patient. We have to work with the CT radiographers. So it's, it's quite a, you know, a lot, lot of background work to get done to make sure we get these done properly. And that's why very few people do them to the level of, to the kind of standard that, that we're able to do. Um, in, in January of this year, the regulators in the UK decided that this was a clinical trial in the UK. And this has caused us a massive headache in terms of, you know, expense and um, uh, time to, 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 you know, clinical trials are really heavily regulated. And this is, this is different in Ireland. The, the um, HPRA said it wasn't a clinical trial and the MHRA said it was. So this is just the type of thing that you get with, uh, with clinical research. And uh, we've also started... Um, so we've started a new, a few new sub-studies. We did a psychology sub-study that wasn't originally planned. We did that last year. Uh, we, we started our sinonasal study and we're doing MRIs in the, the Center for Advanced Medical Imaging in St. James's. And we're starting as well uh, a really exciting um, breath analysis study with a uh, university medical center in Amsterdam. In the six to 11 age group, we're going to be looking at exhaled breath and to see, can we pick up little um, metabolic signals in it? Okay, so what's next? Just, I'm nearly there, just a few more slides on this. So, 
So I've started thinking about this since Recover started. So, you know, we have this great study, we're collecting all this, you know, great information, but we had said at the outset, this is a two year study, we have funding for two years and that's it. Yeah, but, you know, we never wanted to leave it at that. You collect all this really important baseline and follow up data. You want to continue following these people as time goes on, because otherwise you lose the benefit of all of that information. Uh, and we want to know like, how long does it last? Does it wear off? Like, is that different in different people? And one of the other things we want to know is, you know, what's the natural history in young children? Uh, you know, there's a very different story if you, you know, had bronchiectasis and impaired lung function and you got that rescued. That's very, a very different story to somebody who hadn't yet developed bronchiectasis and started on a modulator. So we really want to understand that piece and whether we can prevent disease from happening in children if we start early enough. Um, and, and how would we measure all of this? So... So we're currently planning a new study called Enhance, um, establishing natural history in an advanced new CF care era. And this is really all about life uh, in the modulator area, uh, particularly for kids, uh, because it's going to be so different. And so we've been talking to the CF registry and what we want for Enhance is that it just kind of sits side by side with the registry. And rather than, you know, doing a load of data collection, we're just going to collect things around the annual once a year. But we are going to collect more advanced data like LCI, like CT scans, uh, like adherence and all sorts of other kind of um, things like gut inflammation, um, uh, fecal elastase, stuff that's not collected routinely as part of standard care. And we'd be doing sweat chloride every year. So Enhance, I think, is a, is a bridge or a platform study between the registry and much more detailed short term studies. And we're hoping that if we get it right, we'd be able to get it funded and, and just keep going, keep, keep it going longitudinally and just not stopping. And I think that will really kind of put Ireland, I think, on the map in terms of pediatric CF and understanding the new modulator era. Uh, but I think even more important than that, it'll answer the really burning questions that we have is, you know, can we prevent bronchiectasis? What do we have to do with treatment in young kids who have no symptoms uh, and other important questions? Okay, so um, I'm going to stop there. Um, sorry, I did go on for a bit long. Um, uh, I want to thank the team. There's a huge team behind Recover. I particularly want to thank our uh, PPI group. So uh, Banat, uh, Carolyn and Caroline, who many of you will know, uh, who are intimately involved in uh, CF Ireland uh, and to all the rest of the um, investigators. And so we were lucky to get a lot of funding for Recover uh, from CF Ireland, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation in the US and also the CF Trust in the UK. Um, and if anybody wants any more information, we have a website, recovercf.ie, uh, and you can get a little bit of more information. And we're going to be updating this soon with the one year outcome data. So I'll stop sharing there. Better go off mute. Paul, fascinating. Thank you so very much. Um, an incredible amount of work, an incredible body of work. And I think, speaking as a as a parent, um, I think it's exciting to hear the impact that these modulators are having. Um, as we said at the beginning, and I think you mentioned it again, it's looking at these incremental gains, it's looking at these consistent improvements, it's looking at what we can do, how we can monitor it, and how we can continue to do more. And to hear the change in the therapies, to hear the change in the treatments, hear the change in you know, the likes of this breath analysis test I was there when someone had to blow into a plastic bag. Fascinating uh, little different bits and pieces that are being done now to look at different ways of analyzing data. It's really, really interesting to hear. As we said at the beginning of the conference, obviously not everybody um, that lives with cystic fibrosis is eligible for these modulator drugs. That becomes part of our our continued analysis, and you mentioned it um, as well in relation to the Simplify and Storm studies that are being done in the US, looking at how alternative therapies are being removed. But there is also the importance, as you'll be only too aware of, the continued adherence to these alternative therapies, and more so for people that don't have that eligibility for the likes of Cafetrio or Cambi or others. Um, so we did hear earlier on from Professor Barry Plant, who also reinforced that importance to Alexander Quitner's study on adherence and how adherence is important um, and how we can maintain that sense of focus as people come through the pediatric care to move into adult life with CF. Adherence is your own responsibility and 
ultimately there's there's no magic wand or silver bullet to get perfect adherence in anything in life as we've heard already so um listen i took a huge amount of notes and um obviously very very happy to hear and just wanted to put on the record to thank you and just to thank the team I, I like obviously hearing you thanking Benat, Carol and Caroline but also all of the extended research practitioners everyone in the team who are actually carrying out the research work and indeed the tests with all of the participants um, top class as a parent I can only put my own voice on the record to say that my first initial experience of the team dealing with Senan um, was a very very positive one so I wanted to put that uh, my own personal note on, on, on there.